That's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm, mm, mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset. Hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. If you have ever lived with a puppy, you'll know that it will have no clue whatsoever of the difference between a cushion or your laptop. It will happily chew scratch or jump on either of them. Certainly in my experience, if the cushion or the laptop is on me, then it's probably the most interesting thing in the room to be jumped on or chewed. The value associated to the cushion or laptop has nothing to do with the monetary value or the components inside or what it even does. The only metric that seems to matter to the puppy is how close the item is to me and how much attention I am paying to it. And of course, with a puppy, we may be a little surprised or frustrated by the inability to distinguish the differences of when we're doing something important or when we have time to hang out and pay attention to the puppy or the value of our own items. But it's also cute and it's easily understandable that it makes these mistakes. However, it's not so obvious for other people. We have this expectation that other people are going to understand the things that we hold value for. We'll often expect them to also hold similar levels of respect and importance of, you know, our values. But in many situations, it's completely untrue. Some simple examples to prove that most people don't care about what I care about. The musician who I spent the most time listening to this year was Nick Mulvey on Spotify. And it was the same last year. I follow his Instagram, I know when he releases a new album, and I get excited. It would genuinely take up my week. And most people haven't heard of him. Or, I've run several businesses and spend plenty of time thinking about the startup world, disrupting business ideas, venture capital, etc. And even if some people care about the startup world, they still don't know what it's like to be an entrepreneur, or the amount of stress you have, or why you might care about doing that thing when you could also just get a normal job. Then just looking at that area, you could go even more niche and consider the people who I look up to in the London startup ecosystem or in podcasting. They might be legends of the bubble which I live within, yet in the big scheme of the world and life, those people are completely irrelevant to 99.99999% of humanity. It's actually quite a funny reoccurrence that happens in all cities. Wherever you are, the locals seem to think that the world does revolve around them a little bit. Whether you're in London or Stockholm, Tokyo or Austin, there is a real culture of denial that there is a giant and real world going on outside. But before you feel like these modern times are silly, self-obsession is hardly a new thing. It's a long time human problem. I've recently been geeking out learning about the Han Dynasty of China that existed around the same time as the Roman Empire. If you're into the Fall of Civilizations podcast, they have a really good episode on the Han Empire and also the Roman Empire. And I always find myself listening to it whilst I'm cleaning. I don't know why, but it's perfect for that. Anyway, the Han Empire was hugely relevant to Asia and, well, the world. It was by some estimates 15% larger than the Roman Empire and it was an incredible feat of politics, power, engineering to unite such a giant population of 60 million people then, which is the same population Europe was at the time, and over a land mass of 4 million square kilometres. Such an incredible feat that is completely comparable to the feat of the Roman Empire 
ruling pretty much the entirety of Europe. So you might argue that the Roman Empire is more important because it lasted a few hundred years longer. But the Roman Empire is definitely just history for good. It has ended. Whereas the Han Empire, which is basically China, has changed hands of who is ruling it. It's fallen apart a few times and it's come together several times. But amazingly, that empire that began 2000 years ago is basically still a single political entity and currently the second most powerful country in the world, China. Yet in Western history, we don't even study the Han Empire. I'd never really looked into it or heard about it. And we seem to think that the Roman Empire is the only thing worth teaching our kids from around then. That's just silly self-obsessions. But then something just to add extra curiosity to your thoughts is that when you think about self-obsession, it's actually very fickle when you look at your own internal obsessions. It's been fascinating to see my values over time change so much and I actually realize that I genuinely won't spend most of the time that I'm alive caring about the same things. I'm sure that we've all put energy into things of really high interest at some point in time. Like the person you were obsessed with when you were 16. Maybe you studied a degree for years of your life and never used it again. Perhaps you had a fight over something that you were very importantly passionate about and you don't even remember what it was that you cared about so much. We get easily consumed by a relationship, a challenge, or even an idea, yet a few years later, maybe a few weeks or even a good night's sleep later, we'll have little value or concern for that thing that we thought was important. Yet at the time, it was so important, it was our world. But we completely lost context of the rest of our life and the fact that most of the time that you're going to be alive, you actually won't give a flying crap about that thing that you care about right then. When you think about it, most of us could do an 80-20 analysis of our life and the things we care about and stop caring about 80% of the things we put lots of thought effort into that just don't matter and just focus on the few values that really do and not worry about everything else, just let it sort itself out rather than applying stress and time into worrying about stuff that shouldn't matter. There will be a few very specific things that you want to fight for in your life and everything else you could just stop worrying. Of course, you should still be passionate within your life and follow things with deep interest, but you could still have a more curious perspective on the outcome without so much personal drama or stress. One thing that I found really useful, at least for me, I'm not going to prescribe what I do to others, has been meditation and especially the extended 10-day Vipassana retreat style silent meditation, just because of it actually gives you a reality check to reflect on the meaninglessness of most of my concerns and stresses and it really did give me a greater sense of peace. Now I'm just talking about an example here, I'm not saying you have to go do a 10-day retreat, don't get the wrong idea on this. I found it was a way for me to get a healthy reminder of just the few things that are important and to restore my energy and focus to bring my best self forward without getting so caught up. And sure, various friends have asked me what the point of doing a Vipassana meditation was, and maybe you might seem to think that perhaps I'm someone who is looking for something outside of my life to give them meaning. Perhaps being someone that goes on meditation retreats could have people class me in the box of people that enjoy astrology and chanting. Maybe I'm open to joining a cult or something. But actually, none of those things are my thing at all. But why should anybody else understand what I think is important? I would be silly to think that anyone would have a vaguely accurate concept of what happens when you spend 10 days silently meditating if they haven't done it. I'd be silly even to think that anyone who has spent 10 days silently meditating knows what happened within my own mind. And the point really is that I just shouldn't have expectations at all anywhere. For me, meditation is the opposite of trying to seek meaning from elsewhere. It's certainly not seeking something else to tell you what your life is for. It is just for trespassing out of the madness that is your own tiny window of what you think is reality to liberate myself from delusions hopefully and just marginally extend my awareness of reality whilst losing some sense of self which is otherwise known as loss of ego. Does that mean it will work for everyone? Hell no. Can I recommend everyone to go and do it? Of course not and I don't know how their mind works or what would be helpful for them. 
I can firmly say that one strange thing is that you do have to completely step out of what feels like reality to be able to then find it. Whether that's using meditating or something else, you do have no perspective when you are within something. The classic saying that a fish doesn't know it's in water, if you live within the same culture around the same people, you won't see differently, you'll only see things that feel normal. And if you allow your brain to always follow the same sort of thought patterns, you won't see the oddness of the thought patterns you always choose to take. And sure, sitting still and meditating in silence for 10 days, that is definitely not reality of your life. And so of course it's easy to assume it might not directly relate to how you should then deal with reality or to give you a better perspective on the rest of reality. But of course it's only from leaving your normal thought patterns that you can start to observe what it is those patterns are doing and how they work for you. You might want to go to therapy, you might want to read a book, you might want to do writing and journaling, you might want to make friends with people who are just completely different to anybody you know that will talk to you about different things you wouldn't normally think about. I don't really mind or care. One thing that I found really curious and interesting about the Vipassana style meditation was the humour. People expect it to be really serious thing where you sit and you look all serious and you meditate and you sit there furiously meditating for an hour. But actually, humans are very silly creatures. And when you step back to observe yourself and, well, the stupid things that you obsess about, it does start to look kind of humorous. And you can realize how much silliness there was and is in your life and the stuff that you care about. And you can laugh at yourself. And it really helps you take yourself less seriously. Remember I was saying that 80% of the things we care about, we don't need to care about. And one way to do that is to actually find humor in those things you care about and not worry so much. The meditation leader on a Vipassana retreat is almost like a stand-up comedian, but he's just talking about life and helping you laugh at yourself and be less serious. And sure, you could even say it's like a cult that's just brainwashing you. But what they're trying to do is brainwash you into being a nicer, happier person. So I was all for it, but you might not be. Regardless, life does become easier when you are more bemused by things that used to annoy you rather than caring about stuff that you don't need to care about. Anyway, back to my conversation about values and reality. In most cases, being a good boss means hiring talented people and then getting out of their way. LinkedIn Jobs is here to help small businesses hire quality candidates faster and for free. It isn't just a job board with over a billion users. No, you can find professionals that don't appear anywhere else. 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other hiring sites and many of them might not even be actively searching for a role yet could be open to a perfect opportunity. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours of posting their job. So hire professionals like a professional. On LinkedIn, you can join 2.5 million other small businesses using LinkedIn to hire faster and for free by posting your job at linkedin.com slash growth. That's linkedin.com slash growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. And they want you to ask yourself, what is the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour in the day? Would you go for a run, take a nap, read a book? Many of us wish we had more time, which is something we've been talking about in this episode. But what for? The best way to squeeze that thing into your schedule is to know what's important for you and to prioritize it. Therapy can help you find what matters to you and do more of that thing. Personally, I found therapy with BetterHelp really did help me to stop running around like a nutter so much and make peace with some of the things I thought I wanted to do and do more of what I actually enjoy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, then BetterHelp is entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule. So learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash growth mindset today to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp.com slash growth mindset. When I was traveling, and I'm sure you've heard someone say a very similar phrase to this before, 
I'd been backpacking in Asia for over eight months and I was hanging out with some English people who'd been on holiday for like two weeks. They were going to return home and someone said they were looking forward to getting back to reality. And this, of course, implies that they thought London was reality and the rest of the world was like this plaything that you could step into. Yet the entire world is all reality and everybody lives in their own little reality in every part of the world. And you can go there and that is also reality. As the person said that, I remember feeling worried for my future self that I could get swept back up with the concerns of my future realities and losing perhaps what was the more expansive grasp of being absorbed into different cultures and spending time with different people and not being too obsessed with work and really looking after myself as a whole person being rather than some kind of like robotic entity that just has to get stuff done. And like I said, the things I cared about then whilst I was traveling, of course, change when you get back and you start working. And it's just funny how the things you want change so much over time. And it's so nice to get away and have that break just to spend time with your head in that thinking space where you are somewhere so distant from your home that you just feel different and like that could be a reality for you if you stayed there longer. And it just adds some more perspective on the rest of your life when you do get back home that you can't get when you're actually there living your normal day to day. Okay, so now let's start looking more into the future. We've spoken a lot more about like the past and how we thought and how we are thinking now. And a curious thing about humans is our attraction to a continuous future from now on. We are critically aware of how much we have changed over time. As we grow, our obsessions did change radically and eventually we became the person that we are now. We can remember how we thought we'd love eating sweets and playing computer games for the rest of our lives. When we'd get older, we'd do even more of it and eventually we'd retire where we could just do it full time. And yet now we realize how silly we were. We are now, of course, much more aware of what is really important and we invest our time and energy into that instead. Of course, that is the important thing that we will want to do forever when we are retired. We have instantly blinded ourselves to the fact that our current interest is not our future interest. In the same way, we'll notice all the lessons that we've had and how naive we were about our relationships, career, life, all those hard lessons we've had over the past five years and how blind we were to each of them that suddenly appeared out of nowhere because we just couldn't have expected it, yet we'll forget that next year there'll be a ton of stuff we aren't ready for that will be full of more lessons and current us right now will be viewed as a complete bumbling idiot with a childlike mentality for the things that they do. And that's just in a few years time the perspective you'll have on your current self right now, today. It's a lesson you have to learn again and again in so many places in so many different ways. It's something I also find really intriguing to apply to money and view that from a few different angles. I was listening to a therapist the other day who said that some teenagers would genuinely sign a contract to give you 20% of their entire life's earnings in exchange for $100 today. I'm not saying all teenagers would do that, but I'm sure you can think of one or two that would. And it does directly relate to the point that your current importance in today's problem will have such a discounting for the rest of your future problems. Another point here is how our value of money changes so much over time. I remember getting 50p to mow the lawn for two hours and being excited about it when I was like a six-year-old. And then 10 years later, I got my first job paying me five pounds an hour as a lifeguard and very exciting and liberating to be able to go into the world and do stuff. It wasn't really enough to buy any of the things on my list that I wanted if I also wanted to make any savings. So ultimately, I actually didn't buy myself any nice things like the PlayStation I wanted. I kept it all for just pursuing adventures on a minimal budget. And I got to go and have fun adventures, which was nice. But then fast forward another 10 years and I closed half a million dollars worth of investment into my company. And that's considered like a small investment round. like. Who knows what I'm going to think about money in 10 years time to go from 50p to five pounds and then to half a million. And it's just amazing how much it ratchets up so quickly. And it does make you wonder how many mistakes you are currently making right now with your own attitude towards money and perhaps a failure to think bigger. It's getting in your own way from having more success. Though before you try and start thinking 
directly in the terms of millions of pounds. It's also fascinating to see that it can be really hard to handle big jumps in what we used to without making mistakes or messing things up. I remember my flatmate was watching this TV show where people who were living on government benefits were given £26,000 up front in a suitcase. And the number was chosen because that's the maximum amount of benefits someone could claim in a year if they ticked like all the different boxes. And they did this TV show as like a sort of reality show trial to see if giving people the £26,000 amount right at the start of the year could help them in a meaningful way to get out of debt or start a business or just do something more useful than the continuous small handout across the year. Now, giving these people the money in a briefcase made it like a big TV moment of joy and shock and so much money and families were crying and the person who got it was talking about how like set for life they were, how everything would be solved, it was going to be amazing and everything's going to be so easy now. And turns out £26,000 is not actually that much money if you don't really use it correctly. In fact, the TV show itself kind of became really sad. It's a program where most of the individuals in the study failed to make sensible life choices with their money. They maybe started a business that went nowhere or they spent too much of it on stuff they didn't need or they had a bit of a champagne moment for the first month and went on holiday, came back and he had half of it left, spent it on a training course for something they think would be a good job, found out they didn't like the job that they'd spent the training course on and the money's already gone. And you're like, yep. For a lot of them, it started as a, holy cow, this is endless huge money. And quickly it turned into, oh my God, there is no money. And in fact, most of them were worse off for getting £26,000 at the start of the year than they were for having the slow handouts across the year. Yet I'm pretty sure that anyone given the choice would always take the full 26000 now as opposed to 2200 once a month. So it's funny how we value things that maybe aren't even good for us because we don't even know what's good for us. Anyway, this is all to say that value is in the eye of the beholder. And ultimately, my slightly diverse stream of interesting observations from things that I've noticed lately in my life could lead to the conclusion that value is just very temporary and a very subjective thing that we don't grasp very well. We can understand the puppy wanting to play with whatever it is that we find interesting, but we find it hard to understand that other people might not care about what we care about, and we find it even harder to understand that we might be making terrible decisions right now that we'll look back at soon and think how stupid we currently are, such as decisions with money, or what we're doing with our career, or where we live, or our relationships. It's hard to think that we could be completely wrong. In the end, whatever someone thinks is valuable or important, that might only be correct for a few minutes, or it could of course be correct for years. And it's something, at least for yourself, to try and get straight with what are your long-term values exactly? Because you're going to have waves of different interests in your life, and you should follow your passions, but you should know what the things are that you would never want to sacrifice on, that are your values, and you should be able to think really long-term about those values that will still be there in 30 years time or in 60 years time. And I'm not going to tell you what you should value in the same way that I'm not going to tell you to go and do a meditation retreat. Value is in the eye of the beholder after all. In fact, the only real thing I can tell you is that time is your only resource that you have and that is constantly going down. And it's something that you should value wisely and not trade lightly. As Charles Darwin said, a man who dares to waste one hour of time has not discovered the value of life. So make wise choices, my friends, and I hope this helped give you a few ideas for different perspectives and ways of thinking about your life and your choices. If you have a friend, partner, an annoying sibling who makes truly disastrous life choices and cares about all the wrong things, then do please send them this episode specifically to remind them that they are an idiot and that they finally need to get a grip on reality. Sharing is how this show grows, after all. If you value kindness, you can feel completely free to leave me a good review on any podcast player that you value. And if you didn't enjoy the show, then just wait for the show to improve. Comments, of course, are always appreciated. Any questions, hit me up at Growth Mindset Podcast at gmail.com and remember that life is short so don't waste it 
chasing things that you don't actually care about. And certainly, don't waste your life putting off happiness behind a bunch of goals that probably don't even matter to you in the long run. So take it easy, be kind to yourself, and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too. 